Hi, my name is Mike Goddard. I'm a field engineer in the enablement group at Pivotal. And I'm going to walk you through a section on data manipulation language and data query language in GPDB. So what we're going to go through is the following. We're going to just have a quick intro, a demo, look at the SQL support provided by GPDB, look at the built-in operators and functions, and finish up with a discussion of transactions. Data manipulation language consists of SQL syntax that is used to manage and change data. This includes inserting, deleting, and updating data in tables. Data query language is the art of extracting and retrieving data. So to start out, let's look at some queries and try to use those to illustrate a cross-section of the available SQL capability that we're going to run through in the remainder of this section. Um, so some of this will be covering uh, operators and SQL syntax in general. Some of it will be uh, the built-in functions that you find that uh, Greenplum database being a derivative of Postgres, it inherited a lot of that functionality. So it's got a very rich uh, set of features and data types that are supported. Okay, I'm just going to log in using my PSQL client. Okay, we're going to use a table called OSM uh, for OpenStreetMap. So I took some data, they have a data dump, and I loaded some of that in this table. Every record has an ID, a timestamp, a user ID, a latitude, and a longitude for position. The name of the object that's being described here, and a key value column, which contains a potentially pipe separated list of multiple key values where the format is key equals value. And then there's a geo hash uh, column, which is based on the latitude and longitude. So to start with, let's look at a common table expression query. Okay, so we have this with clause. We're going to name this common table expression sample. And it's defined within this clause that's after the as. So that's the SQL. Select distinct ID from OSM, where current timestamp minus date time is less than 90 days. We're going to order the results randomly, and we're going to only take 10. And then we're going to select from that date, time, latitude, longitude. We're going to use the substring function to take only the first 24 characters of the name and just call that place name. We're going to take that from the OSM table and from this common table expression table. We're going to join those two on the ID and order those by the date time. Okay. The next thing we're going to do is look at a stable function. When functions are created, they can be marked stable, volatile, or immutable. And we'll talk about that more in the slides. So this current timestamp function is stable, which means that over the course of a given query, its output isn't going to change for a given set of inputs. And this one just returns the timestamp. Uh, and that was used up here in the previous query, where we wanted to restrict our result set to any items that were less than 90 days old. So contrast that behavior of stable with this, the behavior of time of day, which is a volatile function. Volatile functions are able to change their result within a given query, even with the same um, parameters passed in. So here you can see that this is just increasing throughout the life of that single scan. And in both cases, we use this built-in function generate series, which allows us to just uh, select some endpoints, 1 to 10, 
So we can select 10 rows uh, from the same function call. The next part here is we're going to look at a combination of two things, string concatenation and the trim operator for strings. So here we're going to concatenate a, a right pointing arrow using the string concatenation operator with the output of trim, which takes a string, in this case I gave it a string that has white space at the beginning and at the end, and we're going to concatenate a uh, left pointing arrow at the end of that, which just makes it easier to see what the trim function does. Okay, now we're going to look at a uh, function called date trunk, which takes a timestamp as input and it truncates it just to the point that you chose. I specified month here. And so you can see here's the date time. And if we truncate that to the month, we just get to the 0901. So we get to the first part of the, the first day of the month. And the same, for example, here, this is uh, November 21st. This truncates it to 11.01. So that's very handy in many applications. Here's another uh, function that's similar, but used for different purposes. So this one's called date part, which will just extract the given part of the date. In this case, it's the month. So it's going to extract, for example, from this one, which references uh, January 14th, uh, the, it'll be a one, and for 11, uh, you know, for November it'll be 11. So a very helpful function. Okay, here we're gonna look at quite a few different uh, features in the syntax of the SQL. Um, we're gonna operate on these key value uh, things, which, uh, as I mentioned, are kind of these aggregates that use a pipe symbol to delimit multiple key equals value uh, pairs and put those into a single string. That's how they're stored, because for a given row, there could be any number of those. So what we're going to do is utilize a subquery, uh, which is here, this uh, from this, this part, um, we're going to select lat lon, uh, the name, that key value from this partitioned uh, version of this OSM uh, data set. Uh, we're going to apply some constraints here in the predicate. We're going to uh, constrain on geo hash, and basically, a geo hash is just a way of partitioning space down into different uh, granularities, and this one's going to be. Um, focusing on this uh, longitude and latitude area. And it's going to have a length of three, so that controls the granularity of the grid. These functions come from this PostGIS add-on that can be added to the database using uh, something called GP package. Uh, we're going to now use a string length as part of the predicate. So we're going to constrain the length of the key value to be between 24 and 64 characters. So the between operator here is useful in many cases. Here we're going to look at values for which key value matches. And this means this is a regular expression operator that is case insensitive, as specified there by the asterisk. So it'll have the word tour somewhere. And other regular expression choices for you uh, are uh, a case sensitive match and uh, you can find things that do not match either case sensitive or case insensitive using that exclamation point. The other interesting part here is we're using an offset of 700 so many times if you're paging result sets or something the offset is very useful to be able to do that. And then we're just going to apply a limit of four. So this will give us an idea what these uh, key value entities look like. And so here they are for 
for instance, here we have tourism equals guest house, um, the street address, and then the house number. Um, and then these are pipe delimited here. So in this case, we have three. In this case, we have this one and this one. So we have two. So again, varying number, and that's why that encoding scheme was used. But, but if we want to actually get access to the individual key value pairs and break them out, each one into its own row, then we use a variation of that query. Uh, up here, we use select star. And here, we're going to do uh, select, and we're going to name latitude, longitude, and name, but we're also going to have this regex split to table function. So that'll take the key value column, and for every instance that it splits out using the pipe separator here, it'll create a new row in the uh, resulting uh, output. So let's go ahead and see what that looks like. So here where we had, so we've got tourism equals guest house, and that was from here. Then we should have another row for this address, which is here. And then the third one for that particular entry is here, and then so on. So that's a very handy function for being able to deal with uh, splitting up some type of aggregate data. So what we're going to do here is we're going to use a count operator. So we're looking at some aggregate functions. And all this is going to do is show us, uh, again, using a regular expression uh, operation, in this case, this matches operator, we're going to get a list of the top 20 uh, most popular um, key names. So place is the number one with about one and a half million, uh, source, amenity, highway, and so on. So, and here we've got this count we're selecting. Then what, what typically you do with the use of these aggregate functions is you use them in conjunction with a group by. So here we're grouping it by the thing that we extracted, which we're calling K here. I should have said group by K, but I, I use the positional uh, version of that. Then we're going to order by two, which is the second parameter we selected, in descending order and just take the top 20 results. So that's what that's giving us. Notice here, the ELE one for elevation is going to come in uh, in a minute here. So what we're going to do here is we're going to again look at some uh, aggregate functions. We're going to look at uh, min, max, and average. So what this is going to do is, and again we're going to use a common table expression here uh, to do this one. So we're going to look at uh, within the key value data again uh, ELE is elevation and we're going to look at uh, using a regular expression to get matches and we're going to just capture any value that's either a integer or a floating point type value and this G means global so match you know as many times as that occurs even in a given row uh, here we're casting that to a float, calling it ELE, and all we want to do is report on the minimum, the maximum, and then the average values of the elevation. It turns out this data is in meters, and on the wiki page for this data they mention that this is really mainly for mountain peaks and that sort of thing, so that's why we have a rather high value for the average elevation. Greenplum is almost fully compliant with the ANSI SQL 90, 1992 standard. It also supports most features from SQL 1999 and several features from SQL 2003, primarily the OLAP features. You can find online a detailed treatment of the SQL conformance. Uh, 
within Green Plum. So managing data, DML, data manipulation language, you can insert data, add it to a table. You can update the data that's in a table and you can delete data from tables. So inserting data, the insert command, fully supported. Uh, single row inserts work fine for a small number of rows. Uh, Greenplum's typically used in really big data environments, however, in which case data is typically loaded efficiently using a combination of external tables and, and a, an insert statement that looks something like insert into target table select from the external table. You can also copy smaller tables using the copy command. In this example, we copy the time dim table from standard in, and it has a delimiter of a comma, and nulls are represented as an empty string, and, and it's, the data has a header. Typical insert statement shown there. Insert into value in names, the values, uh, the next value from the sequence, uh, the value test and u. Updating rows use the update uh, command. You can update individual multiple rows or all rows in a table. There are a couple of ways to modify a table when you need to combine information from multiple tables. You can use subselects or you can specify the additional tables in the from clause and the choice of technique will depend on your circumstances. If you're going to do an update that affects the distribution key, uh, the column used in the distribution key. If you're using the legacy planner, that's not permitted, but if you're using Pivotal Query Optimizer, that would work. And there's just an example update statement. Data can be removed from the database using the delete command with a predicate, typically. If your delete had no predicate, then you'd be better off using the truncate table, uh, as shown here. And you can also drop your table, which will remove the table in its entire definition. There are also a couple of ways to delete rows in a table uh, utilizing information that's contained in other tables. You can again use subselects or specify the other tables in the using clause. Greenplum database supports correlated subqueries. A correlated subquery is just a query that's nested within an outer query block where the inner block references values present in the outer query block. Common table expressions are commonly used in complex analytical queries that often have repeated computations. A CTE can be thought of as a temporary table that exists just for the life of that query. The purpose of CTEs is to avoid re-execution of expressions which are referenced multiple times within a query. Postgres uh, provides a large number of functions and operators for the built-in data types. Greenplum being a derivative of Postgres inherits a lot of that uh, capability. Greenplum fully supports built-in functions that are defined to be immutable. To prevent data from becoming out of sync across the segments in the Greenplum database, any function which is classified as stable or volatile cannot be executed at the segment level if it contains SQL or modifies the database in any way, because it could potentially cause inconsistencies across the segment instances. An immutable function has the property that, for a given set of arguments, it always returns the same value. Immutable also indicates that the function cannot modify the database. It does not do database lookups or otherwise use information that's not directly present in its argument list. If the function is declared to be immutable, any call to the function with all constant arguments can be immediately replaced with the function value, so the function call can be optimized away. Stable indicates that the function cannot modify the database and that within a single table scan, it will consistently return the same result for the same argument values. But it's, it, the result could change across different SQL statements. 
This is the appropriate selection for functions whose results depend on database lookups, parameter values such as the current time zone, and so on. Also note that the current timestamp family of functions qualifies as stable, since the values do not change within a transaction. Volatile indicates that the function value can change even within a single table scan, so no optimizations can be made. In the demo, we looked at the difference between a volatile function and a stable function, so we had a good illustration of that. Relatively few database functions are volatile in this sense, but some examples would be random, curve owl, and time of day. But note that any function that has side effects has to be classified as volatile, even if its result is quite predictable, to prevent calls from being optimized away. Here are a few of the built-in functions, just a very small subset. We, we saw several of these in the demo, so I won't dwell on these. Here are the usual comparison operators that you would use. Um, equals, not equal, to, between, and is null. Some mathematical operators, uh, the usual uh, ones that you're familiar with. Uh, in addition, that square root and cube root syntax looks to be a little bit unusual. There are also bitwise uh, operations and bit shifting operators. So the aggregate functions, uh, in the demo we looked at count, um, average, min, and max, and then we also have some shown here, uh, typically combined with a group by. Null is the value used to represent the lack of a value within a field, which is a column within a row. It represents just the absence of anything. Within the data files you intend to load, you can designate a string to represent null values. The default string is the backslash capital N in text mode, or an empty value with no quotations in CSV mode. You can also declare a different string using the null clause within your copy or create external table commands or within your GP load configuration. It's literally represented just as null and ULL, and query predicates can typically incorporate null in their where clause where something is or is not null. When you start a transaction, you create a snapshot of the data at that point in time. This eliminates inconsistencies that could occur due to changes in the data over the course of the transaction. For example, rows could be inserted, updated, or deleted. And you want to make sure that your transaction sees the data as it existed when your transaction started. This provides transaction isolation for each database session. By avoiding explicit locking methodologies of traditional database systems, Multi-version concurrency control, or MVCC, minimizes lock contention in order to provide good performance in multi-user environments. It ensures locks acquired for reading data don't conflict with locks acquired for writing data. Reading does not block writing, and writing never blocks reading. Greenplum Database provides various lock modes to control concurrent access to data in tables. Most Greenplum database SQL commands automatically acquire the appropriate locks to ensure that referenced tables are not dropped or modified in incompatible ways during a transaction. For applications that cannot adapt easily to the, this MVCC behavior, the lock command can be used to acquire explicit locks. However, MVCC will generally provide better performance than handling locks yourself. Transactions allow you to bundle together multiple SQL statements into a single all-or-nothing operation. We might say they are atomic. They also ensure that the changes persist to permanent storage, so the changes are durable. The SQL commands used to perform transactions are, you can use begin or start transaction to initiate the transaction. Use end or commit to finish the transaction so that its results take effect. Rollback abandons the transaction without saving the changes. The save point command allows you to selectively discard parts of the transaction while committing the rest. 
After defining a save point, you can use rollback2 to get back to that save point. By default, GPDB runs in auto commit mode, where each command is implicitly wrapped in a begin and commit, or a rollback if there is an error. Each statement issued in PSQL is by default its own transaction. The SQL standard defines four transaction isolation levels. Read committed. This is the default behavior for transaction isolation. The statement only sees rows that were committed before it started. Read uncommitted. In Greenplum database, read uncommitted is the same as read committed. Serializable. All statements of the current transaction can only see rows committed before the first statement is executed in this transaction. Serializable is the strictest transaction isolation level. It emulates serial transaction execution, as if transactions had been executed one after another. Applications that use this level must be prepared to retry transactions due to serialization failures. Repeatable read is the same as serializable in Greenplum. Row-level locks are acquired with the insert and copy commands, while table-level locks are acquired using the update and delete commands. If the MVCC model doesn't provide you with the level of concurrency protection you need, you can acquire explicit locks on the table using the lock command. Once the lock is acquired, it is held until the end of the transaction. The lock command must be used, therefore, within a begin and end transaction block to hold the lock on the object you specify. When an object is locked, subsequent concurrent queries that try to access the object need to wait for the lock to be freed. This can appear to the end user or application as if the query is hanging or not being processed. You should be aware of the following types of conflicts. Lock conflicts. As long as a deadlock situation is not detected, a transaction seeking either a table level or row level lock will wait indefinitely for conflicting locks to be released. It's therefore a bad idea for applications to hold transactions open for an indeterminate period, such as while waiting for user input. Queue locks. If a query is submitted through a resource queue that has exceeded its limits, the queue is locked until resources are freed. The PG underscore locks table will show a lock on the queue object for a particular query in session. Deadlocks. PostgreSQL, and therefore Greenplum, has a built-in deadlock detector that catches most deadlock situations when the query is submitted. However, Greenplum does not have a global deadlock detector across all segments in the system. Deadlock detection is local at the segment level. There are rare cases where a transaction deadlock can occur because of a deadlock at the segment level. We explored the rich set of SQL constructs supported by GPDB, such as correlated subqueries, common table expressions, and the types, operators, and functions that it supports. Though the demo showed off only a subset of these, there are many more. Due to its PostgreSQL pedigree, GPDB supports most of what you need out of the box, but you can add more specialized capabilities, such as geospatial support, as your requirements dictate. We also examined Greenplum's support for three of the four ACID properties, which guarantee a database's transactions are processed reliably. We'll discuss the C consistency in another module within this course.